uh, he's a, a, an Australian di director, uh, which we who we were honored to have uh, last year with the film. And for this year, he is presenting uh, other two films to our festivals. So today we will we will talk a bit about these two films and ask him some questions. Uh, we are really very glad to have him here because he's a very prolific uh, director <laughs> and very creative. And um, his films um, are mostly video poems. So this year we have actually two video poems uh, from him. The first is after Im is called After Image. Uh, and we can start from this maybe. Um, after Image is a, is a video poem. And uh, in the description of his film, he writes uh, that after image is the residual image that you see uh, if you look away at a blank wall or something similar, having stared at a brightly lit scene. Uh, so the after image is, an, is a negative of the original in terms of light, dark, and color. Uh, and it is mostly due to photoreceptors in the retina becoming desensitized by the original scene. Uh, it fades after a few seconds as the receptors reset. Uh, so our land, our buildings, our travels, our past, perhaps they all live after images, he writes. Uh, perhaps they all contain after images of those who precede us. Um, so um, this film uh, was for us very interesting. And uh, of course, in this description, we can also see your scientific roots <laughs> somehow and this is very interesting how you mix uh, your your knowledge scientific knowledge with poetry some because there is really a poetry behind this uh, physical phenomenon and you as we saw also in your uh, uh, last year you can really uh, you seem to be very able to find this connection between yeah your scientific knowledge and the poetry that lies behind and this film was for us uh, this kind of uh, film. So um, in this film, we can hear a lot the word uh, them is always repeated and is addressing to these uh, figures like shadows that appears in this, uh, in this place. So uh, my first question is when, when you wrote the monologue for this film, um, did you have a clear idea of who were them for you? Uh, because of course everyone then can a bit interpret or and it's it's very interesting that you leave everything open but uh, what brought you to to address this this uh, them in this direct way and in this way uh, who were them for you <laughs> uh, thank you very much it's a real pleasure to be be part of the festival again this year and to have two film series is wonderful. So I really appreciate the opportunity and especially now to, to talk about it a little bit. So who, who are the them? Who are they? Uh, it's a good question and it is ambiguous and it's ambiguous on purpose because um, the where we live here in, in Australia, in South, in South Australia where I am now, um, it's... There's a big ongoing historical problem, and that is when the British colonists came here over 200 years ago, they declared that the, it was terra nullius, the land with no people, the land that didn't that didn't exist, and they took it for themselves. And then I'm the descendant of those of those people in lots of ways, but there have been Aboriginal people here for 40,000 years, and it's their land, and it's never been granted to the Europeans, to the colonists by any sort of treaty or anything else. So we say we live on here and where I live is unceded Ghana land. It's unceded land of the Ghana people. They've never, they've never formally given it up. So everywhere you go, there is the, this history. It's the, one, it's the longest continuous history of people, of a, of, a, of a culture, of a society anywhere on earth. And... The um, and it's been largely ignored, but they must be everywhere. So there are um, there, certainly the people are still here, but the names of places are still here, um, and their their life, their own version of of what how they live their lives, how it fits in with the with the world and their worldviews is is a very deep and spiritual thing, which we don't have access to very much. 
So that's part of it. Um, but the other part of it's more recent too. And nearly all of the footage for After Image was taken just because I happened to be in the place. It wasn't specifically for this film initially. It was mostly taken with my phone. And it was um, I was doing a part of a, an art installation in an old factory in the port of Adelaide. And this building had, had barely been used um, for, the, for nearly 100 years and we had access to it. So a lot of the interior shots, I just was walking around while we were cleaning up, taking pictures with my phone, and I realised there were shadows coming in through the window and I just filmed those. And then entirely by coincidence, I was in a couple of other places and I thought, oh, there's shadows there, like in the in a pub where we were having lunch, you know, one night and then waiting for a train. And then once I started to gather that, I started thinking, oh, hang on, this, all, this is coming together. <laughs> There's something going on here. Um, and so I went out a few more times with, still with my phone, nearly everything on that was with my phone. Um, and then I took a few other sequences just here at, at there and out in the garden of at night with my camera, which has an infrared um, detector on it so I could film with infrared to, 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 to see at night. So um, another group of them is the people who used to live and used to work in these old buildings um, and who is a, a flour mill, make, making flour for, for bread. Um, so it's them as well. But if you, as you go through the poem, the, exactly who's speaking seems to change. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and 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 sometimes the them might be me and, and my my people being spoken to by the by the ghosts or the spirits or the predecessors in in out there in the, in the mill out there in the countryside out there the people who have been here for thousands of years talking to me as them so it, it shifts it goes backwards and forwards in an ambiguous way. And what I'm most interested in in writing and in, in, in video is, is exploring these ambiguities of, of voice and ambiguities of language. That's interesting. Yeah. And actually, you, you somehow answered also to my second question that I had in mind, because my second question was related exactly uh, to who is speaking because it's true that the voice as well as the them is ambiguous also the voice speaking is ambiguous and uh, this I think it's uh, it's really helping to create this um, suspended atmosphere somehow where everything is possible <laughs> every interpretation is possible and the, your interpretation changes through through the throughout the film so, yeah, and I thank you also uh, because I noticed this also last year, like you are also very generous in describing your working process. And this is interesting for us because uh, we are very much interested in what's behind, what's the, the, the creative process that the director uses. And in your, in your case, it seems that really it's like you are taking pieces from many things and then you find a composition that is not pre-decided. This is, is very interesting. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, and actually, maybe I would, I would already pass to the second film because, yeah, you already answered somehow to some of the mm-hmm. questions that I had about this film. And then we, we come to the two of them. Uh, yeah, your second film is another video poem. It's called The Life We Live Is Not Life Itself and is re- realized together with a poet, Tazos Sagais, Greek poet. Um, and um, in, this, in, this, in this film, uh, you say that Tazos Sagais' poem, with its haunting, haunting soundtrack by Who Does, I hope the pronunciation yep. is good, <laughs> offers us an extended, extended exploration of lives lived in parallel at cross purposes, in and out love, around the world, from the innocence of children to the wisdom of elders. Um, and then uh, you ask, uh, in your description, you ask some question, but what is reality? What is mere illusion? And can there be more to life than simply living? Uh, and yeah, nothing in the video is quite as it seems. So also in this video, I feel a lot of 
ambiguity and a lot of uh, suspension and uh, the film is very much open to interpretations. This is something uh, that is also, um, that is common to these two films. And um, yeah, so my first question about this film, I, I was curious to know how did you work with the, with the poet? Uh, because in this case, it was not you who wrote mm -hmm. the, the, the monologue, but is a, it was a, a poem by someone else. So how was your collaboration? How did it work? Yeah, that, it was a very interesting ex, um, process for me. Um, people normally think of poets, you know, always working by themselves, and which is true, I suppose. But as a scientist, we worked collaboratively all the time when I had 10 people in my lab and we had collaborators all around the world. So uh, I'm used to working with people. As much as I like doing everything myself, it's mm -hmm. also good working with other people. So this project came about um, after I, I met Tarzos um, at the um, Poetry Video Festival in Athens in 2019. And... Um, I, Essentially, the, the video was a commission um, from, from the Institute for Experimental Arts in, mm -hmm. um, in, in Athens, and they were funded to create a series of videos about Greek poetry, mostly contemporary Greek poets, and, but also just modern poets. And they, they commissioned a, a group of people to, um, to do that. And so I did this one with Tarsos as a contemporary Poet, and also as a friend, that was good too. Um, and so he sent me a couple of texts and we talked about them a bit and then we ended up choosing this one, mostly because we didn't have very much time um, initially. We only had a couple of months um, to get it done for the first deadline. And the other texts, I couldn't easily see how I was going to get material together mm -hmm. um, to suit those texts. So we chose this one because it's, I, I could get straight off, I sort of had an idea on, on how we might be able to, to, to do it. I, I like the idea of the travel um, that, that pervades the, the, the poem and also the, the way it sort of shifts backwards and forwards in time, a bit like the other, mm -hmm. a, a bit like the other one. Um, so for this one, I having got the text, I actually did something I don't always do. Um, I went out very specifically. I'd made a list of of ideas for scenes and went, went about around town, around the coast, um, to specifically film things that I thought, oh, this would be good, we might be able to use this, we might be able to use that. So I ended up taking hours and hours and hours of footage, mm -hmm. um, which we only used a small amount. And then I put together a draft of it and sent it to Tarzos and he didn't like it because... <laughs> um, it he said, it needs people in it. We've got to have people. All my poems are about people. And I said, well, I don't do people. I don't have actors. So I don't have access to actors. And um, the in, a, in the time that was available, we just didn't have, it wasn't possible to try and recruit somebody and, and work out a script and direct it and everything. So then I had this idea that, well, you can get, access to artificial people these days and get, mm -hmm. get access to to um to artificial intelligence generated faces oh. and i i knew about that from some of the, some of the work i had when i when i was teaching when i was teaching neuroscience and anatomy and i knew that that, that work was out there so i found a company which um, has a, a library of something like one and a half million um, faces which are generated by artificial intelligence but wow. taken from real photos of real models who are commissioned to come in and, and be photographed um, for the series. So um, and it's an incredible um, resource. So you, you, you can pick the person based on age, on ethnicity, how much hair they've got, what the colour of the hair is, and then you pick, say, three of those and you say, then you pick 20 more like that and then 20 more like that. So so I got so I made a whole lot of I made a library of these of these faces, and then I animated them um, so they merge. As you look, if you look carefully, like they merge from from one into another, it goes young to old, or male to female, or um, dark skin to light skin, or something like that. And that took ages. So um, that was fr almost frame by frame animation 
to, to merge from one phase to the next. So that was that. Then the other thing, um, I, I don't remember how I came up with the idea now. Um, but the other thing, which if you look at most of those scenes where there are people um, in them, if you look carefully, the same people appear twice in the same scene. So you see someone walking side by side and it's actually the same person. Or you see someone walk past and then they're followed by this, a couple of seconds later by the same person walking down the street. And they were all just taken it completely at, almost at random out of the footage that I had when I realised, oh, there's people here. And so then I had to work out a way of, of animating and compositing the uh, the second figure as, as they move. So one, one goes across the screen, then the other one comes across. So I had to have the background had to be fixed and then the, the lighting had to be right so I could um, manually outline them and cut out the little the second figure and then have it move and time it and everything properly and get all the shadows to match up and everything like that. So in that, in that video, and it's actually true for the other ones, true for after image as well, just about every single scene is artificial. Almost none of, none of those scenes actually exist in real life. So even the ones which look like a city street or a, or a park or or inside a building, um, one wall might be from one 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 uh, location. The other wall might be from a different location. And even the, like the, the sky and the seas um, are nearly all made from multiple multiple layers. So so many of the scenes in in um, in both those videos. Uh, composited from as many as 20 or 30 um, individual elements. Um, so Tarzos was, he didn't know what I was doing with all of this. And so I made some samples and, and sent them to him and, and, and he liked them. And so that became, that gave us a, a good theme to go work through. But then even so, it, it, as I was putting it together, it, it, it'd say uh, that scene at, you know, six minutes 30. I hate it. It's terrible. It, it, it's no good. And I say, why? And he said, oh, it looks like some bourgeois car driving through. We don't want bourgeois cars driving through the scene. Okay, fine. So we, we dropped the scene. Or he, he didn't like the way some of the people were moving or we, we couldn't see the relevance of it. And, and then some of the scenes he really liked, we ended up cutting out too. So, um, but that's, that's the way it goes. That's that's the way you make stuff. <laughs> you make much, much more than you need and, um, and and then you throw most of it out. So Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, <laughs> both, yeah, your, your, uh, your dialogue with the poets, like you, you were, it seems that you were really in dialogue about uh, and that uh, his suggestions were, were leading you, but in the same time you were, you were proposing. This is very mm. interesting to know how... The collaboration works, but then also what you said about, uh, yeah, about this artificial intelligence faces and about repeating the same person in the same scene. It's very interesting, I feel, because um, it's something that I feel uh, is very present in your. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I had the impression that it's very present in your works. This idea of uh, taking elements from the reality but then creating this kind of displacement like mm -hmm. this uh yeah impossibilities uh that are just slightly uh mm, slightly perceptible so are not like creating completely uh otherworldly um, um uh, landscapes but in the same time you always have this feeling of that you are in the real world but you are not <laughs> in the same time and this is very interesting like um i feel uh, yeah it's really i mean especially uh, for the themes that these two films addresses is really um, yeah it's really powerful because uh, it creates this exact sensation at least for me it was really it was really this uh, yeah, and I didn't know anything about the fact that you you chose faces that were not uh, existing somehow in real life. Like those faces are of people, <laughs> unexistent people. But it's interesting to know this background aspect because uh, it makes it it makes you reflect a lot on, um, on what is identity in the end, and uh, that's what the film yeah. is about. So 
Yeah, it's it's. I'm I'm really pleased you 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 re react that way because that's what I was hoping to, to do, and that's with, with at least some of these these videos that I make. And people used to ask me when I started, you know, going from into more art and things like that, was how how the science interacts with with my art and, and creative process, and it does in all sorts of ways, but. One of the things, I suppose, the underlying theme, which I which I used to address primarily in my in my poetry, but then now it's moving into the into the video as well, is one of the things that modern neuroscience tells us is that most of what we experience is assembled out of fragments. Mm. It doesn't mean our experiences aren't real and they don't reflect the external world, but they're but they're very fragmentary. And so a very simple example, I mean, as we're sitting here talking, I'm looking at you on the screen, and until I think about it, I don't actually know what's happening out the window out there. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, there's light coming from the window. There's a tree there and there's a chair out there. It's getting dark out there. I, if I start looking out there, now, now I can't concentrate on you. Um, so that's a very simple example. But there's a... Another layer down to just below the conscious experience of what we do. And if you, um, you most, most people experience it just before you go to sleep. You go through a phase when just random thoughts just flick through your little ideas, little images, flick, 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 and you go from one thing to the other. And in fact, even just I mean, as, I'm, as I'm talking to you now, I'm, I'm thinking what I'm going to say next. <laughs> There's all these other bits going everywhere. And um, so one of the incredible things your brain does is to keep attention on, or on what you want to do in the face of a completely overwhelming input of sensory, potential sensory experience. So the senses are recording all the time. Your eyes are recording all the stuff all the time, um, but in little, little snapshots. Um, your skin's recording touch all the time. And until I mention it, you don't think about um, your second toe or your elbow. Now you think about it. Now I was talking about something yeah. else. You think about it again. Um, so the so that so there's this level of of experience which is just sort of just sort of sub subconscious, just on the it, on the borderline between conscious and subconscious experience. Um, that's the first thing, and the second thing is that it's almost impossible to describe that as I'm trying to do now it's, it's almost impossible and as good as language is um, there's lots and lots of things language completely fails at so language is great for giving you instructions on on a shopping list or something like that it's great for telling you a story but if I had to try and explain to you in words how I did that I couldn't it'd be almost yeah. impossible to describe that in words in a way that you could do it without watching, without looking at me. And so there's, there's, there's two levels of experience. There's this there's little fragmentary um, sensory experiences and little thoughts that flick into your mind all the time that are internally generated. So there's little, there's little external flickers coming in, then the internal flickers coming up through your brain, um, which are almost the moment you start thinking about it, you lose them because you end up thinking about what you want to think about. Um, and then the other thing then is, is the fact that so much of what we experience, you can't actually describe in words in any sensible way. And so you can see out the window there, there's a, there's a tree there, and we can easily see, even just on the video, you can see all the different leaves on the tree, and you can easily see they're all different leaves, but you can't describe that. But each individual leaf doesn't have a name. You could try it, <laughs> but, yeah, but you're going to run out of time pretty soon. So, um, and even just the furniture behind me, I mean, that's a couch, but what that, the couch maker probably knows what it's called, but I don't, um, the particular model. So, um, so language fails on lots of things. So a lot of my poetry um, is deliberately ambiguous as a, and it's very internal. So I'm, what I'm trying to capture is this, is this internal um, ambiguity of experience where the language really doesn't work. So in um, 
after image. The language is sort of strange. It, it, it's not quite proper grammar and it's not quite normal speech rhythms and it flicks around. As you say, there's words, them and we keep popping backwards and forwards and I, that's something I like doing. Um, so in Tarzos' poem, in the, in the Greek one, he came at that from a completely different philosophical point of view. No, 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 none of that idea at all. But in fact, the way that he wrote it, it's, it's very ambiguous. It's, it's hard to yeah. know who's speaking. It's, it's, it's hard to know um, who, who we're going to meet again. Is it, is it, as he says, we, we, we will meet again as parents, as children, as lovers. Um, and it's talking about a future, yet it seems to be embedded in the past and the things which have happened in the past. Um, there are good things and bad things, right, slapped up side by side. There's, there's, you know, there's jail and there's beaches and there's, there's Los Angeles and there's Senegal. Um, so um, I think that's part of the reason that we, the, that video came together so well because through different starting points, we came to the, to the same place and that was wonderful and that's fantastic. That's exactly what collaboration is all about, and then we came out into something that n none of us would have done ourselves. So I would, I wouldn't have made a video like that if I hadn't have had that poem. And there's no way uh, Tarsos, the way he normally works with video, would have come up with something that I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's very interesting, and I have to say that really. Um, I can see, it's true that I can see a lot of connections between the first poem who was written by you and the second one, even though, of course, they are also different, but it's true that there is this uh, common thing of you don't know who is speaking and you don't know who whom is addressing to and every, every uh, sentence is, is, is somehow living by itself and you, 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 you can understand that there is a connection but it's not so linear and uh, yeah it's, uh, it's really interesting what I got is, is really this sense of displacement which is not as I said it is not bringing you to a totally another world of fantasy but it's just uh, while you are in the everyday life, you are in the same time you are not. You are on another dimension of perception somehow. So, yeah, this is very is is very interesting for me, and uh, I am sure that also the viewers of your film will will get this atmosphere because it's very it's very strong. Um, uh, thank you. You. I mean, the, the other the other thing just about just briefly about the the science there is that. This just slight displacement from reality. Mm -hmm. It's actually very, very easy in real life to do that. So yeah. I used to do with, with, with my students, there were, there were ways I could um, show that time stops. Uh, you can do that. Um, it's easy to do. Um, we can't do it over Zoom because the frame rate's not high enough. <laughs> but it's very easy to, to, to make it seem as though time stops just for, for a second. Um, it's easy to demonstrate, to make people feel like someone else's body is part of their own. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very famous demonstration. It's a, um, and it's easy to do with most, most people. Um, it's, you can make someone's speech appear to change just by opening and closing your eyes by using very, very carefully doctored um, sounds, constructed mm -hmm. sounds. And it's, again, a very famous experiment um, that was done many, many years ago now. So you open and close your eyes and what the person appears to be, be saying changes. Okay. Um, so there's this, and the other thing which is very easy was not an experiment that we used to do, but a very famous experiment is that it actually takes about a third of a second to half a second for our conscious experience to be felt as now. So what we experience as now actually happened about a third of a second mm -hmm. earlier. And again, it's, it's quite easy to, to demonstrate that um, with very simple equipment. Um, so, so all this slight disconnect, that there's a slight shift um, is that I'm making in these sorts of videos. It's, it's not very far off. Um, what can happen in, in, in real life. Yeah, definitely. And now that you are saying this, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking again about this second film, like uh, 
it's true that it's something that I felt also in your in the film of last year that you presented last year, like this idea that inside one landscape or one image that you of that you that you get, then it's like there are a lot of doors, and inside mm-hmm. uh, over this door b- behind these doors there are other worlds, and you can it's like. Uh, Every image is, is full of doors. And this is really the perception that uh, you, you describe also related to the exp- our everyday experience of life. It's true that in the same time that we are now speaking, I can perceive my legs on the chair. I can feel another sound from, from outside. I can see your tree, <laughs> the garden, and all these things are part of my, exper- my present experience. So. Yes. Mm, this is also something that in the technique you used is very um, is very much um, how to say uh, is very present because uh, for the technique that you use we see a lot of windows and behind the windows there is something else but in the same time in the place there is something else happening uh, yeah and this uh, I think the technique you use is very fitting for for um, bringing this kind of uh, feeling. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting about the wind. I mean, the window is 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 it's partly pra- practical thing for the filmmaking too, because mm-hmm. they make a nice frame and makes it a bit easier to to make those layers and to make, and it also gives a, a a viewpoint, a fixed viewpoint. So, I, s- I suppose another small amount of 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 theory, which comes out from the, the, what I was saying earlier, is that. I actually try in my writing and, and more and more in, in the video work is to create a, a, a first-person view, a first-person narrative. So it's not, not so much that in, in my videos there's, like some, there's some all-seeing, um, independent, um, anonymous cameraman somewhere um, who's filming people doing stuff. No, this is, this is what... This is what I'm seeing out of my eyes, and, and that's what I'm trying to create. In the same way, my poems, nearly all my poems are written in, in first person, um, but they're, they're not, not necessarily me. They're, uh, they're, they're fictitious. They're characters I, I, I think of or groups of people I think of um, to, to tell a particular story or, or present a particular viewpoint. And I like that when, when, I'm, when I read a lot of novels and 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 experimental writing and things like that. And I, I, in general, prefer novels written in first person. So you feel like you're in someone's head um, or even in a third person novel if it's written entirely from one person's viewpoint. So you only ever know about the world through that one person. Um, then that, that's what I really like. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. And, um, yeah, now, now I'm thinking... Mm, I have another question that is a bit um, going to another direction and it's just uh, because I was curious. um, I saw, uh, for what I know of your films so far, I saw that um, there is a special attention that is given to the soundtrack also. Mm -hmm. And for example, talking about the soundtrack, uh, in this film, uh, there is also a very um, atmospheric soundtrack that I think works very well uh, in the direction of um, bringing the viewer to this kind of atmosphere. And this soundtrack is, um, was created by who does? I don't know if it's a group or an artist. So my, my curiosity was, as well as I asked you how you, work with the, you worked with the poet, how you worked with the, um, with the musician and with, with, with the people who composed this soundtrack. So that was... Not normally, I do all the soundtracks myself, so I do all my yeah. own music and perform it all and everything. And um, for 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 the for the life we live, um, the soundtrack came with it. So Tarzos and who does um, who does is mostly one person, um, but sometimes there's, there's two. And um, and he's a fantastic guitar player and uh, synthesizer composer. Um, and he and Tarsos have been working together f- for a long time. I met him in, in um, Athens as well. So the, the, the soundtrack came with it in this instance. Um, and, they, and so the, 
Tarsos had the, the recording of Tarsos reading the poem with that soundtrack came a, as a as a unit pretty much, um, and then I, I worked to to fit the the video to to the soundtrack. But that's the way I do it anyway. I, I nearly always do that for so re regardless of where I start making one of my video, especially the video poems, um, it, it usually starts with the with a pre-existing poem that I've got. And then I think about, oh, this might be good to make a video, what, what might it look like? And I'll go and um, start collecting footage or look through my library and start putting stuff together or animate something. I might sometimes just do it straight from scratch by from animation. Um, and then I do the, the soundtrack and um, work out what, what it should sound like, you know. Is it <laughs> and I generally like stuff loud. I mean, I don't, um, I mean lots, of, lots, lots of video poems, um, they have sort of quiet atmospheric tracks. So the, the one with, with Who Does is quite unusual for me. I don't normally have those sort of flowing sort of melodic tracks. Um, I, I like using lots of sound effects, lots of found sounds, industrial sounds. I just record when I'm walking around the place, animals, um, lots of voice processing. I quite often will just take samples of my voice and just keep processing and processing and processing. Then they become new sounds in their own, own right. I sometimes use sound generators to, for, for voice to text, text to voice um, generators, things like that. So the critical thing then is that having the soundtrack um, the the rhythm of that then be, then drives the rhythm of the video. It nearly always goes that way. Even if I think of what the video is going to be first, then I get I always like to get the soundtrack. And to make that easier for people who are in, interested in music, I, I use um, beats per minute rate the, the, that are evenly divide into minutes, so 120 beats a minute, or 90 beats a minute, or 135, because that makes the video editing much easier because you can do it frame perfect um, I, and it makes it easy to, to keep everything um, sort of aligned and, and changing easily. Um, so then, yeah, so then I work when I do, when I do, the, do the final editing. Uh, I, I, I usually start off with the, with the music, with the soundtrack on, on the timeline and I pop the, the bits of video in it where, the, where, they, where they go and I might, you know, leave a gap if I haven't got that bit and then I... And I and I'll do frame level, you know, um, 30 millisecond level edits on the, to, to get everything lined up right. And so I'm really fussy about that. And, and quite often when I do the, do the voice recording, which included um, some edits on what Tarzos did with, with Who Does, um, I'll shift them up and down the, 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 the time a bit to, to when I know where the video is going, then we think, oh, it really doesn't work there. We need a different transition. Or, and quite often, for my own text in particular, I'll, I'll either re-record some of it or I'll drop stuff out or, or change it or change the order of the text or something like that to make it fit the video as the video comes together. So it starts with the audio, goes to the video, and then I'm quite happy to, to redo the audio um, at the end. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting to know how, how you work. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, yeah, actually, I, I think my, my last question is just related to uh, what are you, if you are working on something new now, if you have uh, other projects after these films that you, that you <laughs> are working at the moment? Um, yes, I've got a whole range of projects at the moment, um, perhaps not surprising. I have, I I've, done a lot of <laughs> I've done a lot of collaboration this year with, with, with artists and they've, they've taken a lot of time and they've ended up being videos which have been shown in galleries or in installations. So um, I've worked with um, two different um, visual artists um, and makers. We had a um, video installation as part of the Adelaide Arts Festival earlier in the year. We've just finished one um, recently um, that, that was um, part of a, of a friend's big um, art exhibition in, um, in, in, the, in one of the big city galleries. In fact, it's her picture on the wall behind me there. Mm. Um, and I'm also working with a group of people on a, um, a theatre production, which is having a, a, a video 
wall um, behind on, on the back of the stage. And originally it was going to be huge. It was going to be like a um, 10 metres across, um, you know, so 10,000 pixels across. Um, but we're not, we're not doing that quite the same way now. But um, in, in doing that, I've been working at how to, how to deal with very, very large format videos. And they, they want everything animated. So everything's just everything's got to be built from scratch. So the, the sorts of things we're talking about right at the start and how I put these scenes together, um, to do that for effectively 8K or 10K video is just about burning my computer up. And I've had to learn a whole lot of new um, technical tricks just for the workflow. So doing, so I've had to break just about everything I do is going to be broken up into little segments um, so that I can do, do some compositing, then render that and then composite the next bit. So I really have to plan everything out. And I am use two computers for doing it, this, this one and a, and a laptop, <laughs> which is a bit newer than this one. Um, and, but even so, when I do it, sometimes I, don't, I have no idea how long it's going to take to render. Sometimes it will take 10 minutes and sometimes it will take 10 hours and you never know till you start. So that's taking time. But I'm also working on a, on a long, one of my own video projects, um, which is working title is Micro Refugio. So um, it's going back to climate and stuff. And um, so micro refuges are the tiny little bits of habitat where small creatures and small plants can sometimes survive when everything else, everything around them has been, is, is breaking down. Mm -hmm. So I'm using all the techniques we've been talking about. Um, I'm creating these sort of artificial, not quite real, environments um, within which um, there are orchids and insects and other unknown native plants, small native plants, um, which will somehow or other um, develop a life while everything around them is, <laughs> is going bad. And I've, I'm using um, ruins. Actually, you can see in the corner there, yeah, there's a box of pieces yeah. there. Um, that they're, that's parts of an old um, inkjet printer. Um, and so as parts in, out in this, in this microenvironment, um, uh, parts of mechanical objects and ruins of, of, of machines and things um, evolve and morph underneath plants and inside in streams and in the background behind um, flowering orchids and things like that. It's taking me ages and ages. So I might be ready for next year. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, we are, we are very curious to, to watch it <laughs> once it will be finished. Yeah. Um, okay, Ian, I think we I asked you enough for now, for today. Uh, it was really very, I was really very glad to talk to you again and oh. uh, also to be able to, to watch other of your films. We, we hope uh, we will be able to screen your films even in the next years. We, you are yeah. always welcome to, to the festival, of course. Uh, once it will be, you, maybe one time you will be able to come physically, but also always to, to have chats like this because it's always very interesting. Mm. Well, thank you very much. It was, it was a wonderful discussion. It's great to talk to you. And Sweden is actually almost my second home. So I've, I've had friends in Sweden since the mid 1970s in Jotaborg and I've been there very many times and I was and I'd love to come and visit you great you are, you are, yeah. you're <laughs> when we're allowed to travel again hopefully hopefully next year we'll be able to travel yeah again. And, yeah. and next year probably the festival will be in summer again it will come yeah. back to its original uh, yeah. time so yeah you're you're always welcome thank you very uh, much. for the moment thank you very much for uh, giving us your time now and of course i for all the viewers who still haven't watched their film after these interviews they can uh, for sure go and watch them because they are worth it <laughs> but there's so many other fine films as well i've been watching the last few days and i'll look some more tomorrow it's, it's a fantastic thank you. Festival. yeah thank you no, very and much. i think it's also interesting yeah. to see the interactions between the films yeah, yeah. inside the section because of course we we try to put them together on a thematical uh, aspects yeah. so yeah it's like you made a travel journey <laughs> inside these films so yeah have a, have a nice evening I guess it's evening yes 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 <laughs> enjoy nice the evening. rest of your day <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you and okay. see you next time see you next time bye. yes bye bye, bye. bye.